There was a documentary recently released called Ivory Tower that called into question the value of um, higher education. Um, claimed that it had lost its way with um, rising tuition and spiraling student debt. By choosing the title Ivory Tower, the filmmaker Andrew Rossi invokes an earlier vision of higher education as a place where students and intellectuals um, contemplated truth and beauty without regard for practical concerns. So what Rossi is suggesting by entitling his film The Ivory Tower is that somehow higher education is now out of touch with the real world. Rossi is not the first person to have suggested that. There's probably not a single college student who hasn't had a parent or a college professor say to them, wait till you get out into the real world, where, of course, every day starts at 8 o'clock. Attendance is not optional. And if you've got a, the equivalent of a D on a performance evaluation, it's not only not a passing grade, you get fired. So if higher ed is not the real world, then what is or should be the relationship of that real world, of, of, of higher ed to that real world? Most people would agree that the function of college is to prepare you for it. But I think there's general agreement, especially among parents who want their children to graduate with a job, that the real world from a college standpoint is the workplace. College is the place where you, um, you, you learn how to get a job. I think that most people in higher education would, would dispute that characterization of, of higher ed as, um, as a vocational training location. Um, and in fact, they would dispute the claim that we are out of touch with the real world. Many of our institutions actually state in their mission that they exist to instill civic responsibility in our students. Our own institution here at Central Connecticut State University is an example. Our mission states that we aspire to prepare thoughtful, responsible, and successful citizens. But that begs the question, what does that mean exactly, to prepare a good citizen, a responsible citizen? Does it mean to um, encourage them and educate them to participate in the democratic process? Is it to make sure they vote? which only 60% of the people in our, our country do on a given day? Or is it to instill in them a sense of volunteerism, um, a, a, a habit of, of giving to philanthropies or community service? And these are all meaningful parts of being a good citizen. But the question I want to ask is, to what extent do those understandings of good citizenship prepare students for the real world? Which brings us back to the original question, which is, well, what do we mean by the real world? The real world in America is a pretty um, complex place. 85% of the wealth in our country is owned by 20% of the population. It means that a lot of our children grow up in poverty. A lot of our children do not have equal access to quality education means that many of our children will start school not reading at grade level. Many will not graduate from high school. Many will not go to college. And even those who do go to college will not succeed at the same rate as their more affluent peers. So what can or should colleges do to prepare students to enter that real world? I would agree that instilling civic responsibility is the correct approach. But equating civil, or, um, e equating civil responsibility with, with participation in democratic process and a habit of volunteerism, I don't believe is sufficient. What if we affirmed that the purpose of higher education was to educate students to contribute to solving problems, the problems of the real world in our community, and if that's what we meant by good citizenship. This is what um, a gentleman named Tom Ehrlich, a highly respected university administrator, president of several universities, 
and a scholar in the area of the relationship between democracy and citizenship, characterized as civic engagement. And he believed that what we should be doing in university is instilling civic engagement in our students. What he means by that is this habit of working to make a difference in the civic life of our communities. And I would say most importantly, developing in students the combination of knowledge, skills, values, and motivations to make that difference. There were two activists who followed in the footsteps of Tom Ehrlich, Harry Boyd of the Citizens um, for or the Center for Democracy and Citizenship, the other CDC, and uh, a man named George Mahaffey at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. They characterized that what, what Ehrlich called this combination of value, skills, values, I mean of, of knowledge, skills, values, and motivation, he, they characterized that as civic agency. And what they meant by civic agency was the ability for people from different backgrounds to work together to get things done in the community. And he required, or, or Boyd and, and, um, and, and Mahaffey ins insisted that this civic agency required special preparation and knowledge. So the question is, how do you cultivate civic agency in our students? And I don't know if you can read the quote from Boyd, but Boyd says, the central problem of the 21st century is the development of civic agency. And what he means by that is that you cannot solve the problems of the 21st century unless you can get people to figure out how to work together to get things done in communities. Now, I want to suggest to you a model that's fairly widespread and occurs here at, at, at CCSU, among many other institutions, the model of service learning is probably the most effective way that I've come across to instill civic agency in students. So what is service learning? Service learning um, involves students who are enrolled in a course, who are participating in a project that is intended to solve a problem or answer a question for a community partner. So you'll have a, a management class that might be working with um, local entrepreneurs to develop business plans, or small business owners develop business plans. You might have IT students helping um, colleagues or partners in nonprofits develop websites. You might have um, students in a nursing class delivering um, health screenings for, at a homeless shelter. So these are examples of, of service learning. They certainly improve in one significant respect on our traditional classroom model, where the teacher is the only audience for student work. Students spend a whole semester working on a project, it might be a great project, might have real practical application. No one sees it but the instructor, it gets a grade. I've been a teacher, sometimes they don't even pick them up. So ideas, no matter how good they are, never see the light of day. At least with service learning, in an ideal world, students are doing work with an authentic purpose for a real audience, and if things work out the way they're supposed to, some of the ideas that the students come up with are actually going to be implemented in the community. And it's a win-win because the, the, business, the, the community benefits from this assistance in, in addressing, addressing its problems. Um, unfortunately, things that look really good in principle don't always work out in practice. Um, Students are not experts in the subject matter, and I think people who get involved in service learning have to manage their expectations, be realistic about what you can expect. But this is a kind of activity that is valuable whether it results in implementing students' projects or not. I mean, if you're a young apprentice and you submit something for consideration by a real partner, you get a, you get a sense of what it takes, what you would have to do for it really to be implemented. That feedback. And even that failure is an important learning experience. But there's another even more powerful dimension to, um, to service learning. And this, I think, is, is what Harry Boyd also saw. If you think about students doing something for the community, you're misrepresenting this as a one-sided relationship. You're doing it for, not for, but with a partner. And nothing happens in the community unless your partner 
is working alongside you. And who are these partners? Sometimes they're people who are very different from our students, but people who have a lot of assets. I mean, students are not the only one, and teachers are not the only ones who bring things of value to the community. You can't get things done in community without community members because they, they, they know the history of the problem, they know the stakeholders, they know the power brokers, they know how things get done, they know who needs to be included. So students find themselves in a situation of having to negotiate um, decisions and making compromises, and Boyd will say that, that is the, the single most valuable outcome of the, in, of the process of acquiring civic agency. It's learning how to work with people of diverse backgrounds who in some cases may be completely foreign to you, who may take you out of your comfort zone. Um, one of the important dimensions of service learning is reflection. So you really want students to be very mindful of what's happening to them because a lot of their assumptions are going to be challenged. And, th and if they're being honest with themselves, sometimes they're going to unearth latent biases that they're going to have to work through as they confront the, uh, the, these unfamiliar um, individuals. So, Service learning can be an extremely powerful model, but it has, it has a limitation that's kind of inherent to the structure. Here at Central, we might have 20 service learning projects going on. They're individual instructors working with individual partners. And those 20 might not have any idea, they might not be coordinated, they might not have any, they might, not be, might, they might not even be aware of one another. So even though each of these experiences can be incredibly valuable learning experiences for the participating students, it's a kind of fragmented, oh, I just did, it's kind of a fragmented approach um, to the notion of solving community problems. In other words, you might you know, fix something in a, in, a, in a business, or you might fix something on a roadway, but you might, or, or you might get some signs up on a street, but the larger intractable intractable problems of the real world are still there unresolved. Now it's been said that the world has problems, but universities have departments. <laughs> and the problem, I mean, this, I mean, this issue is, is illustrated by that, that quip, which is most of the problems are not do not lend themselves to solutions by one course working for one semester. So what do or what can universities do to engage their students and themselves in helping students come to terms with, with these, these larger problems? Well, communities have already figured this out. I mean, for example, you take the, the, um, the plan to eliminate homelessness in New Britain. Who's at the table? Housing officials landlords, job trainers, employers, um, healthcare workers, um, charitable organizations, funding agencies, they're all at the table. And those are the tables that we need to be sitting at. If universities began to think about, we're not going to do it project by project, but we're going to commit our resources to solve the problem of literacy, or and work with all the other person, the other people in the community who are trying to address that problem. Every semester, we, can, we could field a dozen courses focusing on literacy, coming at it from a variety of different angles. I mean, for example, I mean, economists don't solve poverty any more than teachers solve the achievement gap. It's a much bigger, more complex, more multidisciplinary um, phenomenon, and you need that, that diversity, that cross-functionality to address these problems. So that's the challenge that I think higher education has to rise to. How can we become equal players in efforts to solve our community's problems? So what a long way I've taken you from that opening metaphor of the, uh, of the ivory tower. So in closing, I'd like to suggest an alternative metaphor. This is our very own downtown storefront, Community Central. It's on West Main Street, 133 West Main Street in New Britain. We rent this along with um, the New Britain High School. This is a place where our accounting students prepare free income tax, um, do free income tax preparation for citizens. It's a place where our nursing students do free, home, free health screening. It's a place where our education students tutor those students 
after class. It's where community mental health associates meet, meet with and train volunteers to, to meet um, homeless people who come in off the street. They put on art classes and they engage in a wide range of, of community-based activities. And then to think about the distinction that I started at the beginning about, you know, what is college for? You know, is it to prepare you for a job? Is it to prepare you for the world? Well, I can tell you, these students, the ones who are involved in this, this other metaphor of higher education, for them, community education is inseparable. Um, community engagement is inseparable from their education and from their professional development. And for those students, there is no difference between preparing for a job and preparing for the real world. Thank you.